everybody, welcome to another episode, and today's episode is just absolutely out of control. We've got some wild fermentation that we're going to be doing because we're going to be trying to figure out whether or not you can grow koji without the use of a starter. And that's probably been the biggest question that uh, I've received on my koji videos is can you grow it without the use of commercially bought starters? And I thought, what a time to bring in an expert for this particular video. We're going to bring in Mr. Wild Fermentation himself, my friend, Sander Katz. Let's give him a call. Hey, Eric. How's it going, Sander? I'm all right. I'm all right. Sander, it's great to have you on the channel. I know you're a busy man, so let's just get right into it. Here recently, I've been going absolutely crazy fermenting uh, different things with Aspergillus oryzae, or koji. What brought you to a place of wanting to know how to make koji yourself? I learned how to make koji because I was into miso. The first couple of years that I made miso, I purchased koji, but at a certain point, I was like, well, this is awfully expensive. Uh, you know, I'm just going to figure out how to maintain a warm temperature for 48 hours and start making my own koji. So sure, I've been making koji for like 15 years, but I've mostly used it for miso, soy sauce, sake, and shio koji. So shio koji is this, you know, relatively new, I believe, element in Japanese cuisine, where basically koji, salt, and water are mixed together, pureed, allowed to sit at room temperature for maybe 10 days, uh, and then stored in the refrigerator. And I, I mean, I use it constantly as a marinade for vegetables, for meat, mixing it in with other seasonings. And, you know, these enzymes really can penetrate and break down. So, you know, you put it on like a piece of meat or fish that you're going to be cooking that evening for eight hours, these enzymes are breaking down proteins into amino acid. That's the breakdown that's behind, you know, the flavors that we would call umami. Soy sauce, fish sauce are all about amino acids. So you can get that to happen on any of your food with shio koji. And that brings me to my next point when it comes to actually growing koji. You know, if somebody wants to experiment with koji, usually they're going to buy spores and people are increasingly finding it difficult to, uh, you know, source companies that ship it internationally. So can koji be grown without the use of commercially obtained spores? So first of all, just to let people know who are interested in experimenting with koji outside of the U.S. or Japan that, you know, there, there are um, sources that, that will ship around the world. And on my website, which is wildfermentation.com, in my links section, uh, there's a Japanese source called Higuchi. Second name is Moyashi. And you can order koji starter to be mailed anywhere in the world. Now, yes, I mean, it's certainly possible to make a, a, a koji via a wild fermentation. But I will say, like, you know, I, I learned this from... A friend of mine who was in Australia and stayed on a farm run by some Japanese immigrants to Australia, and they showed my friend how they made koji without koji starter. And it was essentially using a corn husk. There's always a, some botanical source. But let me also caution people, I've had 50% success with this method. I've had it work half the time. I've had it not work half the time. My reluctance in sharing with people is I don't want people who wouldn't necessarily be able to recognize if the fungus that they have growing is the right fungus or the wrong fungus to do this. So, I mean, I would absolutely say definitely make koji with a starter before you attempt it as a wild fermentation. Otherwise, you're not going to know what you're looking for. Or you'll know in a very abstract way that I, I mean, I could try to describe it to you, but I would really discourage, specifically discourage anyone from trying it, you know, without a starter. And I describe in detail in my book, Art of Fermentation, how I did this. But I would really recommend that people not attempt it if they've never done it with a starter and don't have a clear idea of what the fungus they're trying to grow looks and smells like because there's nothing like koji. Koji is really, really unique, but it's closely related to organisms that make us sick. So I would definitely recommend caution. But yes, absolutely, it's possible. Okay, let's bring up a point that I know that people are going to experience. So when you put the koji in a condition in which it's going to thrive, other things are going to thrive as well. So what happens when someone starts to grow a bunch of random mold in addition to koji. 
Yeah, well, this is yeah, this this is part of the problem. Like, I I mean, I no, I would not use it if it had a lot of like random mold growth on it. So, in cultures where koji is used to make different things like fish sauce, soy sauce, uh, alcohol, things like that, are they working with a pure culture? You know, they're generally um, it not working with a pure culture. It's not just Aspergillus oryzae. It's a mix a mix of cultures. Japan is the only place where. It involves a pure culture. And in many of them, they do just whatever combination of things grow, they throw in. So, I mean, I mean, obviously, there are organisms other than the koji organism, which people have safely used. Let me take a minute and show you a picture that I took here recently of uh, a bundle uh, of rice that I was using to try to do some wild fermentation with koji. You're going to notice that there's uh, multiple spores on it. So let me know what your thoughts are. Oh, that looks so beautiful. Oh, yeah. I, I wouldn't worry about that at all. So black spores suggest to me that rhizopus is growing, which isn't bad. That's the tempeh. You know, historically, they're, they're, they, they, they've mostly been together. So when it comes to mold colors, what should people know about, uh, you know, what to toss and what to keep? Okay. So, so okay. Green spores are aspergillus. All right. Black spores will typically mean rhizopus. As long as those are the colors you're seeing, I wouldn't worry about it. I would immediately throw anything away that developed a red mold. Red, orange, br bright colors. Yeah, get rid of br bright colors. You know, the molds that people worry about is highly toxic, mostly are bright colored molds. Excellent. Excellent information, Sander. Thank you. Well, we're going to be doing some wild fermentation in the next couple of days, attempting to grow koji without the use of a spore starter. One last question. If someone's looking to get into fermentation, which book of yours do you recommend? For most people, I think starting with wild fermentation. I mean, if you if you love information, if you're interested in history and anthropology and microbiology and are not put off by a lot of words, art of fermentation has much you know is much more thorough than wild fermentation. But you know, some people are put off by like a big book with so much text. I am going to be putting a link in the description box below to your website, wildfermentation.com. That's correct. And from your website, they can buy the book. They can check out where you're going to be, intensive workshops. They can look up Higuchi Moyashi and get that Koji starter shipped anywhere in the world. You got it. Yep, yep. Hey, Sander, listen, I wanted to say thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Great to talk to you. Great to talk to you as well. Thank you so much, Sander. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, let's get this wild fermentation project up and running. First thing we're going to do to make koji, we want to rinse our rice. I'm going to be using jasmine rice for this project. And once the water runs clear, I'm just going to go ahead and let it soak in some water for about 12 hours. I'm going to cover it, leave it on the counter at about room temperature. So 12 hours later, I'm going to go ahead and drain the water. And I'm going to let it sit in a sieve for roughly two hours just to get any excess moisture out of it, at which point I'm going to put it into a steamer. So notice I'm just putting it into some cheesecloth, and then I'm going to put it on the stovetop in another pot that's a little deeper than this one, and let it steam for roughly 60 minutes. After those 60 minutes have passed, I'm going to take it out of the steamer and I'm going to put it at a place where it can cool. I want it to be below 105 degrees. So it's going to be very hot and uh, it doesn't take very long to cool if you spread it out a little bit. And notice right here, I'm at 96 Fahrenheit, so we are good to proceed. We're going to be using corn husks for this project. So I just went to the store, the local market, and grabbed six corns with husks on them. And right here, I'm just carefully peeling them off. So these are gonna be like my little blanket, so to speak, for my, my rice. Not knowing what to expect, I'm gonna use as much corn husks as I can to really increase my chance of success. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a little handful of rice, uh, however much will fit inside the uh, corn husks, and make sure that I wrap that corn husk tightly around it. I wanna try to get as much of that rice touching the inside of that corn husk. And then I'm just gonna tie it off with a little string we're going to do a few of these so you can take a look at what that's like. Mm -hmm. 
now that the bundles are completed, let me show you where we're gonna be fermenting this. So basically, this is just a box where I can control the temperature and the humidity. So I've got a humidifier, a dehumidifier, and I've got a small computer fan, and then I've got a, a 100 watt incandescent light bulb that uh, is regulated by a thermostat, which controls the temperature inside the chamber. So when the light turns on, uh, it heats up that little can, radiating just enough heat to bring the temperature up slowly, and that's what I'm looking for. Right in the middle, I've got my humidity controller and my temperature controller, and this allows me to really control the parameters perfectly. The blue unit on the left allows me to control my humidity, so notice it's set at 90%, and that turns on or off the humidifier and the dehumidifier, and the unit on the right, the green one, controls the temperature. And that unit turns on or off the incandescent light bulb, allowing the temperature to stay regulated at roughly 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that my chamber is all set up, I'm gonna go ahead and put those bundles in there. And we're gonna leave it in there for 48 hours. That's how long it takes for the uh, Koji mold to begin to grow. And notice that my humidity and my temperature are right where they need to be. And we're gonna go ahead and check this for the very first time. Uh, I'm really excited because I, I, truthfully, I have no idea what to expect. So let's take a little peek inside these bundles and see if, uh, if there's Koji flourishing. All right, first bundle we're gonna open up. And the first thing that I see, if you look all the way to the left, you've got uh, some pink, some red mold. You can slightly see some yellow mold growing throughout. There's even some black spores in the top right hand corner. And you see two or three grains with white on them. That's Koji. And so um, I'm not gonna use that one because it had the red mold on it, but let's continue to open some of these up. This one also had traces of Koji, but you can see right in the middle, there's the red mold that's kind of right in the center. So I'm not gonna use that one either. And what I'm doing for this experiment is I'm separating what I would like to consider good patches of Koji versus patches of koji that are uh, growing alongside of other, you know, very colorful molds. So like this one, for instance, there's a little bit of koji on those grains, but there's also a really bright orange mold, so I'm not going to use that. And as I open up a bunch, uh, I'm getting a lot of black, a lot of red, um, traces of, of koji. Uh, and this was the very first one right here that I opened up where there was no red, there was no yellow, and there was koji mold growing on it. And so I separated that, put it to the side. This was an awesome find. This was uh, through one of the bundles. At the very tip, uh, I found a considerable amount of koji growing, and I wanted to show you what it looked like under 250 time magnification. So this is what the mold is gonna look like before it goes to spore. I wanted to put it back in the chamber for 24 hours so that I could see the spores, so you could see the spores. They're gonna be green uh, if there are koji on it. Normally it takes about 72 hours, 90% humidity, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and this is what uh, this is what now it looks like. So in addition to koji going to spore, so is some of the other molds that are growing. Like this one right here, you've got black, red, you've got some orange, you've got koji right there in the middle, if you can see that. Those green, that green mold, that's Aspergillus oryzae. And right here on the very tip, I noticed a nice little bundle of koji. So I'm gonna break that tip off and, and place it inside that ramekin where I've got uh, other koji spores separated. So look at this one right here. This one was absolutely perfect. Koji growing right on the very end of it, beautiful and uh, I separate that as well and put it with the rest of them. But a lot of the rice that I pulled out of those husks had a lot of different varieties of mold on it. And like Sander said, you know, black, not that big of a deal, but uh, when you start getting into the colorful colors, you wanna toss it like this. Notice there's a lot of different colors on there. All right, this is what I'm left with. What I ended up doing was I took one ramekin and only put two little bundles in there and then the other ramekin has a rest. And I wanted to see if there was a difference between the quantity of spores that you start off with. So one obviously is gonna have a whole lot more than the other. So what I'm doing now is I'm just sanitizing a little bit of rice flour, and I'm gonna add that to the spores here in a minute, just to kind of boost the uh, available food for the spores. And it's probably not necessary, but I like to give them a little extra boost. And so all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take all of those put it in a coffee grinder and grind it into a powder. I don't want it to get too, too hot, so I'm doing it in pulses. And now here we go. I've got one bowl on the left, one bowl on the right. They're both uh, part of the wild fermentation. 
just one has obviously more quantity of spores in it. So I went through the whole process all over again, washed, drained, steamed some rice, and now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna add the spores that we acquired from the first experiment. And here it is. So the one on the right has the least amount of spores. The one on the left is gonna be the ramekin with uh, the more spores in it. And all we're gonna do here is we're gonna cover it, place it back in the fermentation chamber. But this time I'm gonna leave it for 72 hours because I want it to go to spore again. So we're gonna leave it in the fermentation chamber for three days, allow those molds to grow, and uh, we'll see what happens in three days. All right, here we go. Three days later, number one was the one with the least amount of spores. Number two was the one with the most amount of spores. But even number one, as I'm opening up the bundle, I, I notice a grain of rice. It's loaded with the Aspergillus oryza fungus. And as I'm opening this up, I am, I am pleasantly surprised. I don't know if you could see this right now, but as I'm unwrapping it, what's visible to me is uh, rice that is just completely inoculated with Aspergillus oryzae going to spore. That green mold that you see on top is the last stage of life for the uh, koji as it's wanting to propagate. And that's exactly what happens within about 72 hours. As I remove the rice from the cheesecloth, I've got good Aspergillus oryzae penetration within the rice. That means I had the right moisture level when I was, you know, washing and draining and steaming my rice. And uh, top level, everything's looked you know, right on track. There's there's no issues with this. It looks absolutely beautiful. There's a very sweet smell uh, coming from it and a very floral scent coming from it. But I did notice that as I started to remove more of this particular, this is number one, remember, as I started to remove more of it, I noticed that on the very bottom of it, I had spots of red mold that was growing. And so that must have been remnant that was invisible to me. So I set that to the side. Uh, this is number two. I followed the exact same process. The only difference was that this particular batch had more spores available. And um, it, it still smells the exact same way. It smells sweet. It has a very floral fragrance to it. And as I'm pulling this off the cheesecloth, I'm not noticing any bright colors, any red mold or anything like that growing. So my thoughts from this experiment is that if you can isolate the koji mold, and repeat the process a couple of times, it looks like you can propagate koji without actually having to have a spore starter. So with all of that being said though, if you've never grown it before, if you don't know what it looks like, if you don't know what it smells like, you really ought to try to grow it uh, using a spore starter, just so you can be familiar with what it's supposed to look like, what it's supposed to smell like, and that way you can be 100% certain that you're growing the right kind of fungus. I wanna thank Sander Katz for joining us on today's episode. Be sure to check him out at Wild Fermentation com. I got links below with the information that he talked about. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section below. If you're new here, be sure to sub, like, share, and comment. We'll see you next week.